Okay. So today I'll be presenting to you the journey I kind of undertook to transition from our backbone based history uh, to a view based history. And for me, this kind of officially started in January, although I had some preparations all uh, starting last year um, when I started looking at it. And we'll have uh, three parts I will go through. First, what were the initial findings when I started looking at it, particularly the most important one? And what was the strategy to resolve it? And then followed by a brief demonstration of it. So when we looked at, when I started looking at the beta one, which I would call the previous implementation of the new history, one of the first things I noticed when doing this profile analysis was that there were rendering delays. And you can see that here, this is a process of how our history was rendered basically from start to end when you reload your page basically. And what you can see is that we at first, we have data providers which fire pretty early and seem to be efficient. There's not much going on in these providers at, on first sight. And then there's a huge rendering delay here until we see the view components actually starting to render on the screen. And this was really mysterious. I didn't know exactly what the reasons were and they're potentially different reasons which contributed to it, of course. So one early assumption was that it might be just related to timeouts used, but that only partially explained this behavior. So we could improve it a little bit, but there was still a significant chunk left. And um, then I followed up by testing, stopping the time basically on the client locally, but while using Galaxy and trying to load histories of different sizes pretty much randomly, just to see if there is a signal, some behavior. And what we see here is the number of data sets in these histories loaded, and you can see the time in milliseconds. Interestingly, you also see that um, here you have this linear behavior, which was very, yeah, somewhat fascinating, but also um, scary, to be honest. And when I looked further into it and narrowed this behavior down, I figured that the upsert operation, which is basically update or insert into the PouchDB database. So the PouchDB database is a client-side database we used to collect all the information. And then the approach was to entirely rely on the PouchDB database. So the data goes into the database and every access or change happens then through the database interface itself. And what I saw in just tests, which I could do systematically locally by just um, inserting um, entries, data sets basically, those are in this sense, they are just objects of data sets into the database. I saw the same linear behavior and at very uh, low performance. So it took about 70 seconds to get 20,000 data sets into the database. And that's a huge issue because it shows that at this point, regardless what we would do, as long as we use PouchDB, we'll never overcome this challenge. We'll always have a huge delay, a huge chunk of lost time in the new history, regardless of what we do, because we are relying on the PouchDB uh, functionality, unless we would dig into this plugin itself, but that's a whole new different type of story. So the solution I came up with, or the strategy to approach this, as I said, started last year, these early um, observations, was that looking at the initial structure of how our new history was set up was that we have a huge RxJS uh, module set which uses a PouchDB database and streams in and streams out of it. And huge because it was significant chunk of the code. Um, and the first step, the very, very first step from last year was to separate the 
ArxJS data providers and the connected database to it from our actual components. And here are two types of components. Those view galaxy components are um, components which are not directly related to the history, but do use history uh, data. And this could be the invocations, for example, where you can very nicely scroll through your data sets. So that would that would fall into this category. And of course, we have the view components of the history itself. So this decoupling step was purely shifting directories apart because previously everything was in one directory. And the nature of it is, of course, that once you have everything in one directory, you'll also have these imports and it's it gets a little chaotic because you can use it from everywhere and it's local anyway this type of idea so this was a purely uh, a pure refactoring of just separating directories literally without changing code and then after separating the directories i noticed that um that there were some dependence some uh, imports which i removed too okay so in the next step and this was the most significant step and the scariest one probably in this transition was to just toss the entire RxJS uh, structure, model structure, and just replace it with simple URL providers. And at this stage, we removed uh, 12,000 lines or 11 and a half thousand lines of code. So we basically returned to square one. But before I continued on working on the URL providers, so just briefly what the URL provider does is instead of using a database or RxJS and streaming data and, and whatsoever, it just plainly, it just does API calls. So it does an API call and gets the data back. Very useful though, because it's easy to measure the time, you know exactly um, what's going on, how many requests did I make and so on. And it's a very, it's a, not a one-liner, but close to it to do uh, use URL providers. Um, in the in this stage, after I replaced the got rid of the RxJS providers, I focused on the view history components, and we replaced pretty much all the components. And here again, we reduced the code by about fifty percent for these. And the goal was to get rid of every kind of unnecessary additional features also to align it much more to the uh, previous history to the legacy history because the legacy history had actually a functionality which was established and it's much easier to keep that going instead of trying to reinvent that too at the same time so it was also that was the last big transition i would say and then I returned to the Vuex stores or to our data providers and replaced the URL providers with uh, Vuex stores. So these are stores as shown here. So that's our current data structure. Um, what we see is that kind of starts off here. I mean, your components sit on this end. They, they import the providers and wait for data or, or request data, but the process for the updating, for example, is that we have we watch the history object at this current stage, and if there is a change in the history object, we ask for all recently changed history items in this in this history changed items uh, module, and then we populate by calling actions um, the other history uh, the other stores which are associated to it. So that's the update process, and as I said, on this side the components sit and they can request data as they wish from these three stores. And uh, Marius was extremely helpful with designing this by uh, creating an issue where he presented three possible solutions and um, reading that helped a lot in order to, I picked one, the second one. And when I started implementing it, it, it also fell in place as anticipated in the issue he created, which was very nice. So here's an overall timeline of uh, the entire process. They're like, of course, um, here are the pull request IDs for more details. It's some interesting conversation going on, I think, uh, also in general on how to approach things like this. And I um, think the scariest part was when we switched over here in this region in end of or in February, beginning of March, where we replace these components, replace 
the virtual scroller and um, there were some concerns because we changed, we removed everything and rewrote the rest. So there were some concerns. Can we actually make sure that we are not getting stuck again with a significant limitation giving the new structure? And uh, I could demonstrate it basically um, with this enabling the infinite scrolling as a as kind of I think a proof that this works already better now than what we had before, and that we should take this route, and then followed up with the VUX structure, which then really enabled the usage. When we went to the filtering part, I think we were already people were already comfortable because uh, the filtering works fast and. Um, and has a new panel and so on. I will demonstrate this a little bit. So one other step, which was a delay here was to decouple the legacy model because it turned out that the interface between Galaxy and the new histories now in this case still used the old history. And there was a huge, um, huge issue, a significant delay, I would say of over a week to figure out what it is and entirely decouple us from the legacy history because it, it could lead to delays of 20 seconds just because of events fired in the legacy history, which we actually didn't know entirely that this entire process is triggered even by the new history. So overall, if we look at the current situation, we have 75% less code and the absurds, so these insert operations, which I now associated with inserting into our store, updating or inserting into our store is 250 times faster. So this whole enables us to have much more control, obviously, of the code. It's much more readable. There's much less overhead, way less complicated. Uh, so people can, and I notice this too, much easier comment on it or understand, make additions. And we had several cases in the UX team where uh, Dave, Ahmed, and others also contributed features, very useful features. And I think this the reduction and simplicity here combined with the performance we achieved is, uh, was very, very helpful. But it was a, yeah, it was a, a significant process. So next, I just would like to show you a brief uh, demo as a video here. Uh, of the new history. So we still have uh, some issues. So there was a fresh reload, as you could see. What we want to work on is this flickering here that the items should never disappear. That's probably a throttling thing. That's my assumption because it just scrolls too fast through too many at the same time. So there is nothing really to render. But you can see that you can scroll now between these uh, thousands of data sets fast from the top to the bottom without any having slowed down. We have uh, infinite scrolling and uh, pagination for um, the virtual scroller and infinite scrolling for the collections too at every level. So it doesn't matter how large the collection is. Here you saw the filtering. The filtering actually relies a lot now on this search field. So it's the one source of truth. Um, and you can add different tags into this filtering field. And at the same time, you don't need to know what the tags are because you can click on this arrow button here and then you get the history filtering panel. And by clicking on it, it will basically populate this search field and tell you um, what, the, what the parameter attribute name is. Here we see the collection builder now. It's also much faster. So the collections do not have to wait anymore on anything. They can directly independently of the history start setting, sending their operations to the backend. Um, there is no connection between the builder and the history itself as it was before. So all the collection builders in the uploader particularly were decoupled. And here we see some basic functionality, adding tags, uh, changing the name and so on. We added, I added this uh, storage dashboard um, which I think Dave uh, contributed for easier access to this um, to this um, size storage uh, button here. And then we have these buttons here now on the side to show um, 
current data sets, our active data sets, as we call them right now, the deleted data sets and the hidden data sets. So it's the analogy to the old histories is huge. Uh, the learning curve should be uh, low. And this is like pretty much the main part of the of the history revision. It's all in depth right now, all these commits. And I uh, hope everyone will test it and get back to us if you notice something. And we also have already some tickets to follow up. Uh, we have bulk operations, which I haven't shown here. Uh, Dave contributed to that. And um, we're working on quite a few things. In addition, during this process, in one transition, when I finally activated the history, what we did and what we probably should never do again, I mean, I understand that uh, I rushed it a little bit. And there were like a couple um, Selenium tests, which, which ran only on the old history. And I was fine with the idea of quickly uh, replacing those, uh, but I didn't want to delay the, the wait any further. Um, and so I fixed those briefly after. And while I was working on that, I ran into the tours and the tour tests and the tours are actually a very, very powerful instrument to um, create pop-ups over the screen and use it as a tutorial. And while I was doing that, uh, the tools it is I replaced our old backbone tour process and with a, with a new plugin, which only focuses on placement of pop-ups itself. So it has no effect. The new, uh, the pop-up plugin does have no effect on the tour flow. The tour flow is now entirely controlled by us and it's much easier. You have full control and it's not complicated. And I think it's also modular enough. And so now we can also do something like play tours. So besides the fact that it restored all the tours which, or the tours we currently have, which didn't work. Um, so now you can just play tours, you have full control. There are only still only two operations available. This is the insert into a text field and clicking something, but we could easily, I think, consider to add more and it works uh, very reliably. And yeah, this is a demo of one of the tours running just by itself on the new history. I think this could be a very useful tool to introduce the features, to help even in some sense with testing, um, because all these tours, uh, the way Denon implemented it is uh, they are also tested uh, automatically pretty much um, as part of the test, as part of the existing testing framework. Yep. And that summarized my talk. Okay, thank you very much, Sam. Um, are there questions for Sam? Maris, do you want to handle the questions? That's probably more technical than I can help with. <laughs> um, sure. um, I mean, if you, if you have a question, just unmute and ask, or you can write it in the chat. So you may have said it, but I missed it, but it sounds like previously, the one of the main bottlenecks was that couch DB. Is there an, what was the replacement for that? I was a little confused on that. Uh, say the last thing again. What was like what? The, the bottleneck previously was like, well, at least part of it was the couch DB. Was there yes. a, so what's the new technology that re functionally? Oh, so now we use with Vuex, uh, we basically use uh, simple maps, JavaScript maps or dictionary. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and that, and that is feature rich enough that sports style yeah, operations. So it's actually pretty. It turned out pretty nice, I think, because so now we have uh, one concern was the pouch TV had these nice select uh, queries, or they seem to be nice. Yeah. you can just uh, select with different um, criteria, like you would uh, like a regular SQL database, and uh, now that was a main feature which we kind of needed. And for the, so now we have these maps and we can just 
have a filter plugin which is specialized on filtering by different attributes on the client and at the same time produce the query to request to send the request to the database so while we filter exactly what we match what we want to match on the client independently with the data we already have we also submit a request to the database to send us all the data which um, fulfills the same uh, filtering criteria and then when this data comes in we just merge it into it so it does work pretty well other than that there is no feature we really needed from PouchDB other than that select and now it's it's our filtering module which is um, much more transparent I think awesome awesome work so that was a question from Bjorn whether the new history would be the default in uh, the next release which the answer is yes and you can I think you can already try it on test.galaxyproject.org so if you go there it'll uh, automatically use the new history um yeah i mean i guess one question is where do you see the history going like um what are the next things you want to do like i am um, i think the the transition to view was something long awaited because it also blocked many other projects that wanted you know that didn't necessarily involve um rewriting the new history but adding smaller things so uh what are your thoughts on that so I think I have two ideas or um, potential ideas, I would say, where I would like to see it go. I mean, one is already in the, in the description, which was suggested that we have um, this mini maps and add additional ability to visualize which tools were run in what order. I think all the data is available now. So it's a purely, you know, um, view related thing to just start off fresh and, and create something, but the data is, is there, which is very nice. I think that's very interesting for us. And then another thing I was thinking about, it would be really nice if the two forms, when they populate their data, I know there are concerns and it's not entirely clear, will it be entirely possible because of the data validation we do, but it would be extremely nice if the two forms would not for every select field, for every tool input data field, uh, make a full request and get pretty much all the data from the backend because that's probably the single most slowing factor of the UI at this point. So if we have histories with 70,000 or 100,000 data sets, which I think this model now covers, um, then we will still have this delay when we select a tool until the tool form appears. And the biggest part of it is, as I said, the data. So if we can expand this or use these stores to populate at least partially the tool form, I think the entire UI is gonna be much, much faster. And we will not have this dependency on the size of the history anymore, which would be very nice. So that was another question. Is the overall uh, user interface rewrite in view still ongoing or is it sort of the last uh, the last big thing? Um, like you mean the components or or I, I think I think in general, like how, for instance, what what portion of Galaxy is still using uh, backbone, what portion is still using Mako, which are the two previous? Oh, okay, okay, just in general, I see. So yeah, this is by far the biggest chunk. So I think I would have to go back to our MVC directory and take a look there. Uh, overall, I think with this, we, we are pretty strong now on the view part. I don't think there are any huge critical issues left to transition, but there are, of course, even these little um, classes and modules, which we still have, uh, will, take a will take some time. But uh, overall, this is the biggest chunk. We are pretty much. I mean, maybe I can inject another question. Um, do you think Galaxy will become a single page application with a top level router at one point, or is this always going to be the way it is now? No, I think it will become one. I okay. think we, we made good progress. I'm pretty sure it will become one, and that's a big goal. And it fully, I mean, it's difficult to make prognosis on this, but hopefully within a year. That'd be, uh, I think, a very reasonable goal, to be honest. 
we could probably do it. Still, there might be, there might be, um, and others might know more about it to, to a certain extent too, there might be this, that we still have an analysis uh, entrance point and a workflow entrance point and a login entrance point, but these three, four entrance points, but overall it should be, um, particularly the analysis view should be a single app. So I think we've hit the half hour mark. Um, we could keep going. I see more questions or um, we move to the second part. I think we're moving to the second part. So thanks again, Sam. Very yeah. nice.